Hello, everybody. We just had a lovely chat with Steve Green from the drama school Fourth Monkey, didn't we, Matt? It was really great, wasn't it? I mean, what I love about Steve is the fact that he um, he's a realist. He says it as it is. He's not um, spouting any bullshit. He speaks his beliefs and it's backed up in his work. I really enjoyed talking to him. What did we talk to him about, Christian? Well, exactly that. And we chatted all things from drama schools to agents right the way through to just completely disrupting the industry. Uh, we spoke about in the individual qualities of actors and bringing that to the table, which was at the forefront of what they do at Fourth Monkey. Yeah, and this was just a very enjoyable episode to be a part of. I could sit and listen to Steve talk about things for hours and hours and hours. So we hope you can at least listen to this episode length podcast with Steve Green. Before we play the interview, while we've got you here, we'd love to ask if you could subscribe to our podcast. If you haven't already, please leave us a review, a positive one. If you could, would be great. If you believe it, I hope they do. And if you could follow us on our social medias, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Talk to us, engage with us. We're loving growing this community and our followers make it what it is. So thank you so much for clicking on this podcast. We hope you enjoy In The Room with Steve Green. Hello, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you, Matt. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, good evening. How are you doing, Christian? You good? I'm very well, thank you. Fantastic. Well, we've been waiting to chat to Steve for so long, and it's fantastic to finally have this opportunity to sit down and talk to you about your career and really um, dive in deep about Fourth Monkey and all those types of things. So Absolutely. thank you so much for chatting to us. Um, are you ready to get, get talking? Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Let's go for it. Fantastic. So um, industry transitions are something that fascinate us, how someone can go from acting to casting or directing to writing. And before we talk about um, Fourth Monkey, we'd love to know what was your experience in this industry before you decided to just, you know, set up your own drama school? Cool. It's a good question. And I guess, I mean, I guess from my point of view, um, but that's the way the industry is now. I think everyone like, you know, is wearing and carrying more hats than they did back in the day. And I think, you know, my time many years ago now came out of training, I guess, through a traditional route initially, you know, started working as an actor, doing the, the, the standard stuff, do some really lovely work, um, not necessarily doing the work you want to do always. Um, ended up working on camera quite a bit. Um, didn't really spend much time on the stage, which was a shame. Um, that was where I wanted to be, but I think it's just the way it plays out, right? So mm. that transition, you know, then started to evolve, as you do, I think, as a working, jobbing actor. You start dipping into other things, don't you? And, you know, you, you find that you start doing a little bit of teaching here and there, a bit of practitioner work and facilitating in various institutions and what have you. So that was the segue for me from acting through to um, working in a practitioner context in drama school and training environments. Um, and then start finding myself working in an agent's office. And that was a lot of fun. And um, made that you know, transition quite smoothly and felt quite comfortable in that space for a little while. Um, it was quite interesting, so working from that side and seeing that side of the fence. Um, and then obviously, again, back into that drama school world that you're still sort of freelancing in and you're putting on those different hats, just started directing more, which is something I had a real passion for when I was studying. And that then became, if I'm honest, it became my thing. I started to really enjoy directing, you know, um, and started to write my own work, started to dabble in that and pick that up again. So I think I was quite lucky for my training. I, you know, I went through for quite an untraditional training journey back in the day, whereby we were given the opportunity, I went to Middlesex Uni and did their, their, their BA course there, which was very much about liberating creative ideas as opposed to the traditional roots. And I think that gave you that wider lens. So I think that you know, traversing from different role to different role to sustain your professional life um, it's quite natural now and it was certainly natural for me then and it's how we ended up where we ended up I guess in many ways. Wow you've really covered a lot of the bases of the industry haven't you with the directing and working in cast directors offices and that's cool. It's been um, fun. Yeah. Yeah I was going to ask about um, you know even setting up an, or establishing a weekend stage school is a mammoth task these days 
where did the desire come from to found and establish your own drama school? And what did those really early stages look like? I mean, Fourth Monkey has an incredibly strong identity. Was this the case from the very genesis of the idea? Hmm. It's a great question. I mean, I guess, obviously, you know, to, to be sitting here talking about Fourth Monkey and exclusivity on my own is, is a bit unfair. And, you know, it's good. it ain't just me. You know, I think, obviously, Charlene yeah. Quay um, as our director of training and our co-founder of the school and its, and its guys, um, you know, is a massive part in this whole conversation. Um, and I think through our lenses and the people we work with at the start, it was about trying to, I, I guess, in, if I'm honest, we were born at a moment of anarchy, if I'm brutally honest. I think that's where we started off. It was like there is a different way of doing things. And that's not for a moment to say we um, believe that we're you know, superior in anything we think or do, but that basically there was a different way of doing stuff. You know, I just touched on like, teaching and working in drama schools back in the day, you know, talking 20 years ago now. But, mm. <laughs> but back then, the narrative very much was this kind of binary journey. It was like, I got to get my agent from the showcase. That was it. That was that was the training journey. That was the training objective. Yeah. And I found that problematic because it wasn't the way I saw the industry um, or the life of an artist without being too much of a pretentious ass about it. Because I think that's <laughs> fundamentally it, right? You know, we're we're artists at the end of it. That's what we're training people to be, to be artists as opposed sure. to be commercial commodities. And I just felt that the, the, it was a bit skewed. The perspective was a bit skewed and there's maybe a different way of looking at it. And I guess initially we became a production company and then it was kind of like still having those same old conversations. There's a different way of doing this. And then I think at the time, you know, it was kind of like, well, stop talking about it. Put your money where your mouth is. If you think there's a different way of doing this that could offer someone a different route or a different way of looking at this industry or a different way of training, because there was space there for it, um, let's actually try and do it. And slowly but surely we started to basically build that. And it it caught the imagination at the time, I think, partly because, like you say, the identity was quite strong. The way we were working at the time was, and still is, you know, very physical, very embodied, quite anarchic, like I say, in terms of the play choices we were doing as a production company. And, you know, we were flipping genders in terms of our casting 20 years ago when that wasn't even a thing. You know, people weren't even talking about that as an option. So all that sort of stuff just felt a little bit nouveau, I think. And I think that caught the imagination of young people who are maybe looking for a different route into the training and training environment. And maybe those people who'd had doors closed in their faces or didn't feel like they, they fitted, you know, and that continual rejection of the industry. Because let's be clear, it was an incredibly exclusive place then. It still is now. Let's, let's be candid about it. Yeah. But 20 years ago, this industry was... Yeah, it was profoundly, profoundly exclusive. So, Stephen, I really liked what you said about um, the journey of the artist. And as you say, it's the, it's the only way you can say it. You don't want to sound uh, like an arsehole, but it is the, the only way you can say it. And that in my view and a lot of other actors views, drama schools, some of them produce a product. And to pluck a name at random, you do get a, you know, a rather actor, some people would say, and that mm. these guys are products of their drama school. But these days in the spaces that I engage in and the people that I talk to, more and more, it's becoming uh, seemingly more important to be part of this commercial space, to know your your branding, what what is your product, what do you offer, what is your USP, all these commercial phrases are becoming seemingly more and more important in the acting space. How do you connect that with the journey of the artist, um, as you said, without sacrificing what it means and without sacrificing your um, your uniqueness? I think you just hit on the key word, uniqueness. I think that is the thing. <laughs> like, what, what, what is what is you? You know, what, 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 what defines you as an artist and what defines you as a human being? I think I completely hear what you're saying about the, the, the drama school product. And again, not disparagingly mentioning any schools, but working as an agent back in the day, you would know, you know, you'd look at a, a portfolio of actors coming through, I mean, the, the yearbook group or whatever. It's like, okay, there's an XYZ graduate. There's an XYZ graduate. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can see where they've come from and you can understand what their training is too. Um, that's, that's valuable. Let's not, let's not, like I say, let's not knock on the head. But I think what's more important and more interesting maybe is 
like you say, to start from what the individual is. Because that, that's, what the, that's what the product ultimately is. It's about empowering the individual to find their true self. What is your true voice? Um, as an actor, as an artist, as, as a maker, um, as a collaborator, all of those things. Where do you sit within this world? What stories do you want to tell? What stories do you want to be part of? Yes, sometimes you're going to have to play the commercial game and you're going to have to lean into this particular job whereby you know, you're playing whatever, you know, whatever role it might be in, whatever it is, you know, that just pays the bills. You've got to do that. But then as an artist, you've got to carve your way through the industry, ticking those commercial boxes to keep all that stuff moving, but carving out that space whereby you can do and present yourself in the way you want to. And yeah, that is about understanding your casting, understanding how the industry sees you, but it starts from you understanding yourself. And that, to me, and certainly in this building, that's what our training is founded on as a principle. What is your voice and your own authentic voice? We ain't going to RP the hell out of you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. See what I mean? I think it's really important. Like, what is your authentic voice? I can't can stand Shakespeare delivered in RP. That terrible, it's like, okay, I'm now going to slip into this Shakespeare mode. What, yeah. what, what's just happened there? You know, it's that's weird, mm. <laughs> especially in the contemporary world. So, how do you take up that space for yourself to understand what your career is, um, and make it what you want it to be, and don't apologize for that. If that means on a Monday you're you're teaching yoga, and on a Tuesday you're facilitating in a drama school, and then you know you're doing that whilst you're on tour or whatever it might be, or whilst you're doing your you're filming on your commercial or whatever. Be you. Do you. I guess. Yeah. No, I, I, I answers your question, but it it, it does. It uh, because I, I agree with you, and in the sense of you know RPing the shit out of things and 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 that type of thing. I think there's so many variations within drama schools, and you know lots of teachers come in and teach at drama schools and aren't part of the main faculty. But a lot mm-hmm. of the time, you hear stories of you know, being um, broken down to build them back up again as this new person that is like in the in the image of the school, as it were. And, you know, what was wrong with the person that got the place at that drama school initially? That is that same person, right? And all You're these so attitudes. I, I really don't understand it. And, and it, you know, I think everyone can say that there are great days at drama school and bad days at drama school. I think everyone's a liar if they say it was a whole great three years. So I don't feel bad about saying this about my own training, that there were days where, you know, I, I get told that I literally was not being myself. And I, what do you mean? I'm not being my, how, how do you, how do you know me? It was really quite a confusing thing. So I really like what you're saying there about, guiding people towards their authentic selves i think that that's really important um i'd love to ask you um about getting fourth monkey into that drama school conversation because if you ask the average actor or just the average person that knows a bit about drama name three drama schools they're probably going to tell you you know uh mm. rada lambda Guildhall, possibly with a few others in a similar footing what challenges have you faced getting fourth monkey even into this conversation as a credible drama school for actors to train at without compromising some of your more establishment challenging ideas Again, these cra- these questions are cracking. I, I think <clears throat> so. Our training, I guess, is built on the the principle and the foundation of demystifying the bullshit. Um, and I think tr- staying true to that has been the challenge, in a way. I think I think a lot of us who work in this sector um, are you know are very obsessed with um, our our process or our, our philosophy, you know, and and making acting actually again exclusive and inaccessible by making it feel really difficult, um, and it be an intellectual journey somehow. And to me, fundamentally, that is just that is, it just absolutely goes against everything I believe, and I can speak for Charlene in that too. Being an actor fundamentally is connecting with your true, genuine self, and like you just said in regard to the whole thing about breaking the actor down to make them bullshit. <laughs> Who am I to define you? The space that I create as a training institution is a space where one hopes I I give you space to find yourself, to find your, like we just said, authentic voice, to find your creative self. That's what our job is. And staying true to that is difficult. 
uh, like because you're you're pulled into like established directions by you know the industry of actor training I, again i'm it's, and it's established for very very it's like you know positive reasons i'm not going to sit here and like you know like i say negatively comment on any other school i would never do that i think there's there's value and celebration in every sort of training philosophy and pedagogy within this country and indeed the wider world. But what we've tried to do is try and take the best of what the UK does, look look further to the West, and um, try and you know try and look at other sort of principles that apply you know um, in the states. You know, we've got quite a Meisner philosophy here, and then look to the East too. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and you know, really genuinely like some of the stuff they do in France, like the Lecoq narrative. My background's quite clowny. I was lucky enough to be trained by John Wright back in the day. So my my influences are quite clown based. That sense of play in a rehearsal room, that's important. Charlene's a Meisner trained actor. Those things to us are really straightforward and simplistic in the sense that the way that they strip away all the BS from actor training and bring it back to the individual self. But like I say, staying true to that has been difficult. Getting ourselves in that space to be viewed as credible alongside the established schools obviously that's been challenging but i think you do that by staying true to your philosophy by connecting with people on a genuine human level where you possibly can i'm not saying we're perfect but that's always been the mission statement when you come from an audition here the narrative that we give to our audition team is our job today is to see everybody who comes in the room and to make sure they are genuinely seen and I think that is our job in an actor training context every single day. And I don't, when I say that, I don't mean I see the commercial viability of an individual or I see the, do you know what I mean? I see the individual. And oftentimes what we're looking for in audition is far removed from what some of the other schools are looking for. And because we're looking for something that maybe just, you know, moves to a different beat and just... Someone who's connected with themselves on a different level is what excites me. And people who come from every single walk of life, you know, this school's still quite an international school. And, um, you know, even post-Brexit, you know, um, it's a whole different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's important to us. Like cross-cultural learning, incredibly important. How do I learn what art is in, in Italy? What, how does it influence me? How do I genuinely get informed and engaged with that? What can you bring to my room? What can I bring to your room? How do we grow? How do we broaden our lens as artists collectively and collegiately? How do we build a genuine functioning ensemble and create a space whereby I'm not standing on you to achieve or to be seen by my head of year, my principal, or whatever it might be? Because I think this industry is about collaboration. That might be really naive, but I think the more doors you open, um, the more opportunities you present for yourselves and indeed others. And that's what it should be about. It shouldn't be about yeah. this exclusive thing. Yeah, I can agree more. And I really like what you say about looking for the actors, individu- individu- oh, as a word I can't say, their individual qualities in terms of, you know, what they're bringing to the table rather than, because I, I think back to my own time at drama school and when we we're doing Stanislavski and Meisner and Lee Strasberg and things like that, I'll, mm. it, it can really take you off the path of just connecting with yourself and the other person in, in that particular moment. So I like what you're saying on that. Um, so the drama school audition process is an infamous one uh, with so many varying opinions on everything from monologue choices to the best time to send in your app cl- application and things like <laughs> that. Um, so we'd definitely direct anyone looking to apply to go to the audition page on your website for some brilliant tips, a little plug there for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and from your perspective, Steve, what are yeah. the most important things auditionees can do to give them a better chance of getting a place at fourth monkey? Um, so our day is a, yeah, good question. I mean, I'm, without giving you like a, a stock answer, I think it's about, the ability to come in through and actually just trust that you're going to be seen and trust that you can be yourself and we're actually looking for you to be yourself. I think one of the one of the things I find challenging in an audition process is the well-trained or the well-prepped student. Um, that's obviously fantastic on many levels, but you're oftentimes getting trying to get past the mask to understand who the individual is. You know, mm-hmm. it's certainly in the interview context. It's like, I want to know who you are. And I understand it. 
You know, you're going through this audition process and you don't, you're guarded. You don't want to say anything that's going to basically come across in the wrong way. And you get these stock drilled sort of audition interview answers, right? Mm -hmm. I quite like them, if I'm brutally honest. The, uh, the, sorry, the ones that come off the beat. I mean, like, you know, I like people to actually really be themselves and to challenge you a little bit. I think to have that to take up space, <laughs> I think that's quite cool. But in terms of what we're looking for, our audition process for a start, it, there's a, we don't charge for audition. There's never been an audition fee over the last, well, certainly the last three years. And prior to that, it was a very nominal fee. We had nice. audition fee waivers for everybody, um, for everyone now. So that's a positive thing to enable people to get into the space. And when they come into the space, they'll be here for a whole day. So they're going to go and transition from an ensemble warm-up to a movement session, a voice session. Um, they'll do some clown, they'll do some ensemble playing, they'll, they'll obviously do their speeches, they'll have a rework of their speeches, they'll have an interview. So they'll be thrown through loads of different environments. And we don't expect everyone to get all of those rooms, like, you know, not flying, we're not trying to get box ticks. Um, you're going to find some of those rooms and some of those sessions challenging, right? And that's part mm -hmm. of the gig. I think it's about coming in and not trying to get something right, just coming in and actually with an open mind, open heart for the day and just coming in and playing for eight hours and just again trusting that you're you're enough it sounds so simple doesn't it because we've all heard it a million times but just prepare well have your speeches ready to be reworked and just come in and be open-minded and come in and work with an ensemble mentality and yeah. that's what i think really identifies the fourth monkey student mm -hmm. a sense of yeah an understanding of what ensemble means. And everyone has a different interpretation of that word, obviously. But something, you know, the word means something to them. Yeah, I, I, re I really like that, Steve. And just even shout out again the fact that you don't charge audition fees because if, um, you know, you're able to do that with, with Fourth Monkey and still be a financially viable business, then I frankly think there is absolutely no excuse for some of the... Um, you know, ancient drama schools that have been around for however many years. I don't understand why you have to charge eighty pounds. Not oh. anyway. We'll move on to the next question, but just have to oh, applaud we could, you we for could that. talk about that. We could talk about that for hours. I think exactly. You, I appreciate it. But um, I think that needs to be rightly praised. Um, this is quite a long question because we're quoting your website, but I think it's important. Um, we've mentioned already, and you've spoken about how strong an identity Fourth Monkey has. And I think your mission statement on your website sums it up perfectly. So I'm, I'm just going to read it out as wrote. Um, our mission and vision for Fourth Monkey as a drama school, arts organization and registered charity is to challenge the status quo and interrogate what has gone before through inclusive, dynamic actor training programs, free audition days and outreach workshops for students and young people, plus collaborations with other like minded arts organizations and charities. I mean, we really love that. And the question following it is, do you think challenging the status quo is essential for the creative industry moving forward? And how does an individual, not an organization, behave in that way without risking compromising their career, as you're often told by people to play the game? Hmm. Great, great question. Um, I think, yeah, challenging the status quo is essential. Um, is simple, straight answer to that question. I think it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, like I say, with, with anarchy, I think with, with age comes a maturity and more reflection and a more reflective approach to change, right? And I think that's important. But I think we have to continually interrogate what this industry is, what it's about, what it's there for, and how it can be improved. And I think for too many years, and I've been part of this because I was in it, I've, you know, I've worked in it for a number of years, but for too long, it sat in a very like, complacent place. Um, and I think that's been to its detriment. And I think the work that's been produced as a consequence has been to its detriment. And I think if you look at the times we live in now, obviously just coming through this pandemic, you know, no, we're not through it yet, are we? Let's be brutally honest. Mm -hmm. But um, this, you know, this is a moment when you look back through history which I'm not preaching here at all, and not even, not certainly not to the, preaching the converted, most certainly. Like, art comes out of challenges, right? Those, those times in history whereby 
things ain't going quite the way we think they should or whereby things are being challenged in a different way or whatever. That's when real art is challenged, whether that be politically, socially, economically. That's when real art appears and art serves what I think its purpose is to actually create debate, create conversation, dialogue and fundamentally change. I think that's what art was there for, in my opinion. It's to challenge society's ills. And I think as those of us working in the industry, I think it's our responsibility to do that. And we don't need to do it the way we're offending people, upsetting people, agitating. But I think as individuals, there's a, there's a responsibility to take up whatever space we feel we're entitled to take up um, and to allow space to those who don't have that space. I think that's, that's our collective responsibility. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that as a you know white middle-aged male. Like, how do I support someone else to take the space that is owed them? How do I not occupy the space they're entitled to have? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think that challenge, for want of a better turn of phrase, is incredibly important. If it's done with sensitivity and it's done with integrity, I don't think you do compromise yourself. I, I, I think... The whole playing the game thing, I get it. I absolutely get it. And I see it day in, day out, not in this environment necessarily, but like in the outside professional world with my peers and associates and whatever. You see people get caught up and tied up in knots and contracts and whatever else. You know, this industry is complex in terms of the way it's managed and the way it's set up. It's set up hierarchically. And there was always the thing back in the day, you know, my my day, or be careful how you do this, that, you'll be blacklisted by equity and you won't work, right? That's an unspoken thing still, isn't it, in a way, which is what you're referring to with play the game. But I think, trying to be constructive in my, in my language as opposed to rambling on, it's about challenging when we see things that we don't feel are right in a constructive and professional manner. Um, and I don't think that's ever seen as playing against the game, in inverted commas. I think it's, in most people's eyes, or the eyes that you want to probably value, in my opinion, that's seen as a really positive and progressive thing. When people actually observe something and see something and see where change can benefit others, that's humanity at its best, no? Exactly, yeah. And we could have much more of that in the world, mm-hmm. um, in my opinion. That's a fantastic answer. Actors Coaching International are offering 20% discount on their acting classes for In The Room listeners. Go to actorscoachinginternational.com and put In Room 20 in the discount code or email hello at actorsci.com. Act, move, collaborate. They're what you call the four core pillars of training at Fourth Monkey. Mm-hmm. And what do you mean by them? And how do they work in practice in your training curriculum yeah cool well we work in a very integrated way so those four pillars i guess you know the objective is for us to create again back to that word artists who have the sustainability to traverse the industry and all of its different forms so yeah i can do the traditional acting thing whatever that may be so i can get my nice commercial gig or whatever the word i'm not trying to make the word commercial commercial sound dirty by the way but you know like i can make you know i can get that gig through my acting prowess but i can also be employed as a mover i can also be employed or work together as a as a maker or a collaborator with others or i can actually make stuff for myself whether that be digital media whether that be writing my own work whether that being having the ability to put together my own arts council application for my own company that to us is so important the ability to basically traverse the industry and have again sustainable career the days of waiting for your agent to phone and not looking after yourself or being accountable for yourself, they've gone. And quite rightly, in my opinion, we're only ever accountable for our own careers. Because you know? all we do is we come out of our drama school setting, we complain about the casting we got in our final year shows, then we get our agent and we come out and we complain about our agent because they're not getting us seen enough or this, that or the other. Very rarely is the question asked, what are you doing? <laughs> Mm. And I don't mean that in a, it's like a challenging way, but it's a really pertinent question. How are you taking accountability for your own career and your own life? Let's, let's interrogate that question because that's where the success comes. So if you're accountable for your own creativity, I can go and make my own work. I can go and make opportunities with others. 
So you're not just dependent on someone else. Because for me, that's why the fall off in this industry is so heavy in terms of numbers. Because people don't have the understanding how to navigate the industry. Back to the, the 56-year-old actor I re- referenced earlier on who's, you know, traversed the industry with his other half for like, you know, 35, 40 years, got two kids and whatever else. That to me is success because they've understood how to work the industry. Because that celebrity moment, you know, that, that Dirk Jacobi career or whatever it might be, those are rare. Let's be candid. So how do those of us who are passionate about being artists really make it last for us in the long term? And those four pillars, they integrate throughout the training in the timetable sense. You'll do all of them every week. Like, you know, you'll be working through all those different practices every week in a myriad of different forms. Like we do loads of practice when it comes to movement. We do loads of different acting practices through Stanislavski to Hagen, Meisner, etc. But every single day you're doing at least one acting class, every single day a movement class. Every single day of voice class, every week there'll be a devising, at least one devising or making project. And same with the assessment journey. So everything is about covering all of those bases. I wish, like I say, you move every day as well, whether that be Kotowski or Laban or Lecoq or Suzuki or Buto. So we mix it up through a very international lens. So constantly trying to challenge our students to go, okay, what am I taking from this? What is my toolbox going to look like? to enable me to have a career that I can take ownership of and is defined purely by myself and my training and my relationship with it. That's yeah. how it integrates. I like how you speak about looking at training through the international lens as well, because, you know, to people that are very well read and um, and on it in the theatre industry or the creative industry as a whole, a lot of the names you mentioned will be familiar, but to you know your standard actor possibly or to let's say consumer of entertainment the idea of uh seeing international products of entertainment is actually only just starting to come into the sort of collective consciousness with things like you know the latest one being being squid game and um you know is, yeah. it, is it call my agent the french show and then before that with parasite winning the oscar and mm. it's really nice to see um the different ways of art being created um uh, actually coming to the forefront of our industry now um i'd love to talk to you about um people handling drama school training because it's hard for people to know how you're gonna handle it until you do it and Mm -hmm. uh, because so many people uh, including myself were obsessed with getting into drama school what not really thinking about actually what would happen when we when i did (laughs) um and it's a huge task for anyone emotionally and physically um regardless of what school someone attends um, how would you recommend an actor approaches their training or their life around training on a day-to-day basis to get the maximum from it and leave in the best position possible? Good um, industry career advice question. It's wicked. I mean, I think the first thing with that is find the right school for you. Um, and you do have a choice in that, even though oftentimes we don't feel like we do. Ultimately, there is a choice. You can always say no if it doesn't feel like it's the right fit because that training environment needs to be your home. It needs to be somewhere whereby you, you feel you can go into that building and fall flat on your face and be celebrated for failing because that's what it should be. Um, if you don't feel comfy in a space for whatever reason it is, then maybe that ain't the space for you. And I think, again, you need to listen to that. That's the first step. I think once you're into that building and you're celebrating the school that you're going to and the school is celebrating you, I think then it's about living right and balancing that life, isn't it? I think, you know, you've got to find a balance whereby you have your downtime, you have your work time, you have your processing time, you have your social time, um, you have your time for your partner if you have one, you, you know, your cat, your dog, whatever it might be in your life that you need. Well, actually, I'm, I know that I need eight hours sleep a night. I know that I don't go to the theatre enough, so I need to actually get myself up to speed. Um, and I could catch up with some of my peers by making some more theatre trips. I know that... Um, I need to go to the gym because it's good for my mental health. I'm, I need to meditate, whatever it might be, right? All of that stuff is making the whole, and it brings it back to that same starting point. Who is the individual who's embarking on this training journey and who are they and how do we celebrate them? Because that is what this is all about. What does that individual need? And I think it's incumbent on the training provider too to actually celebrate the individual and look at them and their own needs. So, what, so John comes into the rehearsal room Jane comes into the rehearsal room or the classroom, they're going to need different things. We're going to have to see their individuality and the differentiation between the two of them. But that also applies to how they conduct themselves outside of the training room as well. How do we support them to understand who they are as adults, to understand where their accountability lies to be the best version of themselves? And 
that to me is what your training journey is about as much as the learning you do in a, in a classroom with a practitioner, your growth, your individual growth as a human being. Um, Cause that's what sets you up. And then when you get into that final year and it all becomes intense and pressurized and <laughs> angst driven, keep your feet on the ground in terms of the reality of what it's about. Cause we all get caught up in those agent conversations and this, that and the other, and the fear and anxiety of stepping out of this industry especially the world it is now. No one knows what this industry is going to be in five years' time. It's forever evolving, mm. especially on the back of the pandemic, right? So I think it's about just staying grounded and really just being patient that this might take time. I might not get an agent day one. Showcase might pass me by. Cool. I understand how to navigate this industry because I've taken on board my training and my learning to enable me to do so because I'm here for the long haul. It's not a momentary thing. Um, and I think, you know, from our point of view, it's important for us to try and support our alumni with that too. And I think that's incumbent on all schools as well. And I know a lot of schools do that brilliantly. You know, to support someone when they step outside that door after that, the final shows and graduation. How do we, you know, support them in the industry afterwards? We've got our Revolve program, which is like a professional development program that our students can come back and dip into and do some stuff which is really lovely some of them take advantage of it some of them don't everyone has a different journey but for those that need that it's really valuable to get back in a room with someone they maybe have an audition for a while but okay i'm back in a room and this has been a subsidized workshop and, it's, and i'm back seeing some of my peers i'm back in a familiar space i feel safe again i feel like i can do this because mm -hmm. that's as much of it as anything isn't it Holding on to yourself and um, yeah, not falling foul of, of all the external pressures that can come. Yeah. Yeah. You spoke a bit about pressures there and, and the all important third year. And when you get to that point and, and trying to get that agent, just a, just a quick question really on that. Um, what advice do you give to your students that don't get the agent? Cause that's, that can be, uh, you know, really devastating at the time for a third year student. Just the, what we've just touched on, really, like to understand how else you can navigate it yeah. and to understand there is a different way because there is. What Often specific time, things do you mean when you say what, how, what advice would you give to navigate? Well, to, to, okay, so how do we plot our journey when we finish this, um, when we finish the training? So maybe it's about us going off and making some work with some of my peers. Maybe it's about following that pursuit. Maybe it's about you know, trying to get some short films on my, on my portfolio. Maybe it's, maybe it's about just engaging with being in a workshop room and being practicing in front of potential casting directors at workshops and whatever else. But i.e. stepping into the industry and still feeling like an actor and like an artist, as opposed to feeling, inv feeling invalidated because you haven't got an agent. The agent doesn't validate your talent. The agent just makes that transition easier. And sometimes those that leave with an agent are those that have the slowest journey. Sometimes those that have to navigate the industry from that starting point of being on their own and only supported by their peers, those are the ones who really understand how it works. Those are the ones who engage and invest in what it is. And in the simplest sense, do something every single day that reminds you that you're an actor. Doesn't matter where you're working or what you're doing to pay your bills. Every day, whatever it is, submissions on Spotlight or whatnot, yoga class, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That it's, it's about being proactive and staying in the game and not feeling like straight away at the start of the race, you're out of the race. <laughs> sure. Does that answer yeah. the question? Yeah, no, it definitely does. I think it's really, uh, it's really key to highlight that there's plenty of things that actors can be doing with, if they have an agent or if they don't have an agent. So You've got to be in a room. I mean, like the British mentality to me has always been flawed in the sense of I've, you know, it happens in the room, doesn't it? Like I've, I've done my voice class, now I'm going to go into my acting class. Never the twain shall meet. You know, that, that's, that's a classic thing in a training environment. How do mm -hmm. I get them to go? You know, and then it happens when you step outside. I've now done my training, I'm now an actor. Okay, cool. What, what, do, what do dancers do? <laughs> dancers go back to the bar every single day, right, if you're a ballet dancer. And I think a dancer's discipline and an actor is a gift. Um, and I think that's what I would encourage any actor to try and take on that same discipline and application to their craft, although I hate that word, application to the, themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
keep practicing. Lovely. I agree with you. I think sometimes, um, you know, speaking as a un- currently unemployed actor, we we almost wear it like a badge of honor, like being an unemployed actor is the job. <laughs> mm, yeah. almost mentally do you know what I mean uh, and that you, you know that waiting for the email or phone like I, I think I am a productive individual and I am doing things but there's always that voice in your head that goes you're an unemployed actor you just wait it's it's that little um gremlin um on your shoulder um we've got one more prepared question before we move on to the um rapid fire section and it Definitely. feels like you know we're on the cusp of big changes when it comes to drama school training and um, Fourth Monkey are obviously one of the main innovators in that space. What changes do you hope to see in the future for actors training? I know I've rambled some of these answers, so I'm going to try and be a bit more concise. Um, a genuinely inclusive space. I mean, it sounds really trite, but like a genuinely inclusive space. A space where everyone has equity. Um, and uh, training environment should be a space that celebrates difference, in my opinion, because that's that's where art is born. I um, mean, different different opinions, different perspectives, etc. So, a space that celebrates difference, whatever that may be. And I, I'd like to think we're moving towards that in some way, shape, or form. I think we're a million miles away from where we should be, but I, I think. For me, that's incredibly important. And from that celebration of difference and individuality, there's the key word individuality, we end up with much more individual journeys and we end up creating artists as opposed to machines. You referred earlier on to, oh, the actor, you know, that they're X, Y, Z trained. I think we need to eradicate that. I think we need to find a place whereby we can celebrate the individuals and creatives and, and like the joy in I like that joy and passion and creativity. Do you know what I mean? Creativity at its absolute best comes from individuals being liberated to speak their truth and their voice. And oftentimes in a training environment, we spend loads of time taking away that voice, neutralizing that accent, neutralizing that internationality, neutralizing that cultural cultural heritage. And it's like just, you know, making everything, frankly, fucking beige. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need to move away from beige. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I that's, think good. that's where we're going, hopefully. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Well, thank you, Steve, for answering all those in-depth prepared questions. Now it's on to the oh. silly rapid fire questions. We have 10 questions for you. Some are actor related, creative related, some are idiotic. We have got 10 questions prepared for you that we'd like you to answer in one sentence or less. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Rapid fire Go. question, Steve. Go okay, it. I will kick us off. Hold Stage, on, you're not editing this one out. Um, <laughs> well, uh, okay. Go. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not going to do the bit again. So we're just going to jump in the questions, and this is staying in. Okay. <laughs> I'll kick us off. Stage <laughs> or screen? Stage. Four monkeys or twelve? Oh, good. Four. Netflix or Amazon? It is Netflix, actually, to be fair. Favourite film? Oh. Wow. Can I have two? Go for it. Parasite and Lives of Others. Mm-hmm. Favourite accent? <laughs> um, Essex. <laughs> Non-fiction or fiction? Non-fiction, actually. Would you rather listen to the In The Room podcast or the Joe Rogan experience? The In The Room podcast, obviously. Duh. <laughs> Silly question. <laughs> Singing class for actors, yes or no? Oh, that's an interesting one. I think no, you know. <laughs> it's really... Okay. <laughs> you wish no. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of yeah. I, I'm 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 kind of on the on the edge of no on that one. To be honest, I see it's I see it's value, but yeah, I'm kind of a no yeah, in a sense. You've, you've just become Christian's best friend in the whole world. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm talking about individual singing classes. Do you know what I mean? It's like I think that's a, yeah. There's value outside of the classroom. Ensemble singing, brilliant, wicked. But I just yeah. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Is drama school a must? No. Controversial. 
Um, are agents essential for actors? Again, I'm going to say no. It's a double no to finish. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. I feel like um, what I've really liked about you is you're a realist and you say it as it is and you stick by your guns. And I just respect that. And what you're doing with Fourth Monkey is so exciting. It's been brilliant to talk to you. Um, Christian, have you had fun as well? Amazing. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I'm glad we agree on the singing classes. (laughs) <laughs> I might get told off for that later but oh, yeah thank you you do I have a singing tutor at Fourth Monkey that's gonna <laughs> well there may, there may be a lot of people who come after me with that particular one yeah you never know fantastic have a lovely rest of your day Steve it's been a pleasure thank you, you too take care guys thank you very much